Hello and a very warm welcome to a special edition podcast from us here at MIGSO PQ'd. I'm Charles Woolman and today we are very lucky to have a special guest talking to us about her distinguished career and some tips with managing wellbeing, a topic which is very close to our hearts here at MIGSO PQ'd. I'm delighted to introduce Jennifer Kehoe as our guest who will be talking to Becky Gage, one of our consultants and a big advocate for wellbeing. Jen has quite the CV a serving British Army officer, author and professional skier who competes with visually impaired athlete Mena Fitzpatrick as her sighted guide. They became Britain's most decorated Winter Paralympians, most notably winning four medals at the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang 2018, including gold in the slalom. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Becky and Jen. Please take it away. Thanks so much, Charles. So, Jen, first of all, can we start with you giving us a little bit of background to your career? How did you get from the military to being a Paralympic ski guide? Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks for that great introduction, Charles. Um, It's brilliant to be part of the P-Cubed podcast. So, I've had a bit of a convoluted uh, and unusual military career in so much as I joined nearly 12 years ago now and had a a regular career for about five years, um, including a tour in Afghanistan. But when I went for my first dinner where I met my commanding officer, I sat next to him and said to him, I would absolutely love to take soldiers skiing. Um, I grew up in Switzerland and he said, oh, funnily enough, we are looking for an Alpine skiing officer. So um, I'll consider your request when you join the regiment. And that was the start really of what has been an incredible adventure in Alpine skiing through the military. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to be able to take the soldier skiing and and then got selected for the army team myself um, and went on to represent both the army and the inter-service teams in Meribel and even down in Australia, kind of in my own right, before getting involved in the para skiing. So it was in 2013, I was competing at the inter-services in Meribel and a coach uh, who's also a Royal Engineer and was working with the Armed Forces para snow sport team as their lead coach at the time, came up to me and essentially headhunted me and said, the team are looking for guides. Have you ever thought about being a guide for a blind person? And being brutally honest, I didn't even know that blind people skied. Um, it, it wasn't something I, I'd come across. But I thought um, my, my past experience with para skiing, I was really impressed by what it was and how it gave people who had often suffered quite a lot of trauma um, or, or had their opportunities limited in life an opportunity to experience incredible freedom so I jumped at the opportunity and uh, went on a trial and was accepted onto the team in March 2013 as a ski guide. That is quite an unusual career path. (laughs) Um, Also really fascinating that you've managed to build a career out of something that's been a passion of yours and then also something that you can help others uh, to kind of get into that passion too. I think that's really brilliant. So obviously this year has been a bit of a different year to usual. Um, Can you tell us what's been going on in 2020 for you? Mena and I continued skiing together until the end of the 2019 season where we had the world championships and the the plan was for the off season um so winter 2019-20 for me to return to the army to complete some essential training we would then pick up where we left off in March 2020 and resume our Paralympic campaign for the Beijing 2022 Paralympics um, which is our our current goal. Clearly March 2020 was a bit (laughs) unsettling to say the least for everybody and all of that went out the window. So having expected to go back into a full-time training program, traveling all over the world, time in Southern Hemisphere this summer on snow training and lots of time in the gym and a very clear goal of what we were going to achieve it went to not knowing anything, being stuck at home, having to kind of self-motivate to do training, having to build up a gym at home and just really find a lot of self-motivation to keep training and keep working towards this goal that actually none of us even know whether it's going to still be there in, in two years' time with the summer olympics and paralympics being moved to next year we have no idea whether any of this is is going to happen so march to july was at home training on my own trying to find some motivation then in july i was fortunate when it opened up in europe to travel to europe to 
get some on snow training and, and start my return to snow program. So by this point, I had been off snow for about 15 months. Is that with, quite a long time for you? Yeah, normally it's only two, three months of being off snow in a typical year. So from end of May to beginning of July, perhaps it's maximum two months. So having 15 months off is quite significant. And while I've been doing a lot of dry land training, as we call it, you need to train the skills, the on snow skills as well. So um, I was very fortunate to be able to get out on snow in July. And then obviously it all, all changes, quarantine started coming back in and different rules. So the last few months really have just been working out where we can go, if we can go and with the support of the GB team who to, to their credit actually have been working very hard to try and enable us to, to get the best training we can do. And the government has now given permission for elite sportsmen and women to go and travel abroad without having to quarantine on the way back. However, we still have to comply with the regulations to the countries we're going in. So there's a huge amount of uncertainty around what we're doing in the same way that I think we're all feeling whatever industry you're in. The rules are changing weekly. The goalposts are moving as to what we need to do, what we can do. Do we need to be tested? Is it safe to be going? There are so many questions and, and uncertainties around what we're doing. So, yeah, we're, we're just having to be flexible and work almost on a day by day basis to decide what we're doing, which makes what is already quite an unsettled lifestyle even more so. Yeah, of course, especially when you're you're training for a, a goal that's quite a few years away. And I'm sure you have quite a regimented training program as well. And it's, it must be really difficult if you can't stick to that and can't plan what you're supposed to be doing over the next weeks or months. It must be really challenging. You mentioned about how you had to self-motivate when you were at home. Do you have any tools for doing that that you could share? So one of the things that um, worked really well for me was actually getting in touch with Mena. So Mena was injured back in the very end of February. She broke her leg in a race. So lockdown for her has actually not been that different to what it would have been under normal situations because she's been at home rehabbing. But we both found that we were struggling a bit to motivate ourselves. And so um, we started doing Zoom gym sessions. So I think what I would say is having an external person arranging a time to meet up and actually do something together has really helped me because you you're then beholden to that person you can both help each other commit to your goal and so I think sharing your goal and making a commitment with somebody else um, has really helped me to stay disciplined and keep pushing myself because it's really easy when you're on your own to not put that extra weight on or to not do the session for quite as long because actually there's something that's more interesting to go and do and and actually if we don't do the training we're not going to be prepared for the games is the simple truth of it it has been hard to day in day out find that motivation so yeah um, sort of connecting with someone else to get a bit of accountability and encouragement with each exactly. other exactly exactly and Mena has really helped with that she recovered now she's pretty much yeah so we're heading out to Austria on Sunday to go and do two weeks training on the glacier there uh, which will be the first camp that she's been out outside of the UK for very exciting so the topic and um, practice of well-being is something that is really close to our hearts here at MIGCO P Cubed um, and something we're trying to really raise awareness of across the organization so it'd be great to get your take on what well-being means to you after you sent me the invite for the podcast I had a, a little look into what well-being is sort of from a from a more academic perspective and the three things that came up quite regularly um, was feeling comfortable happy and healthy and I think that sums it up quite nicely taking that for me in the context of well-being meaning we're comfortable happy and healthy it's important for that to be not only like physical well-being but also mental well-being which is a, a something that is really really important at the minute with so many changes in the world but also social well-being and those are the three topics that I, I thought I'd use to frame my thoughts around it. Well-being is such a hot topic with Covid with so many challenges everybody feeling quite isolated uh, there's lots of discussion around how we can help improve people's well-being mental well-being particularly. I think it comes back to the this idea of resilience and being flexible in what we're doing so on the physical side of it for me I use fitness as a way to improve my physical well-being if I don't do fitness 
on a daily basis I get really stressed and quite grouchy and generally can be quite unpleasant to be around um, I think probably because I'm used to doing it to such a high level so maintaining a really healthy fitness routine is something that's really important I think if you can incorporate that into your daily life whether it's a half an hour walk or a, a bit of yoga or some pilates or a run or whatever it is that makes you feel good then i think doing fitness in some capacity is really really important to physical well-being and i know it makes a huge difference for me and i'll come on to a bit how how that's affected me very personally quite recently as well um, a bit later on but the mental side of it again being in lockdown uh, I was quite lucky and I had a, a housemate, so I did have somebody to talk to. Partway through lockdown, she got seconded over to a job in London and moved out for six, seven weeks. And suddenly I had nobody to talk to. Um, I was having to, again, self-motivate, do all my training by myself. Uh, had nobody to talk to in the morning, nobody to wake up and have breakfast with or have a chat with. So it was quite a lonely existence. And I was really, really reliant on connecting with the outside world to, to get that. So to overcome the challenge of feeling really lonely and feeling like my mental health was deteriorating, I made sure I was challenging myself with different things each day. So whether that be reading a new book um the the thing i took up during lockdown was actually the guitar it's something i've wanted to do for ages a friend of mine lent me a guitar back in january and i'd never really had the opportunity to do it um so i decided to challenge myself and try and learn it thankfully the fender app became free for three months so i've really used that as a way to to improve my own uh, mental well-being and feeling challenged and the other thing I thought about with regard to the mental side is this idea of needing to feel respected having the respect from our friends and peers and I think that it's been quite interesting transitioning from the back end of 2019 going from being um, very high profile in sport to coming back into the military and having to readjust to being in amongst peers who have gone and done incredibly well professionally in the military where my experience is much much less from a green army perspective although I can stand up and hold my head higher in in my achievements in the sporting world I was coming out back into a world which was very unknown to me and, and quite uncomfortable and so readjusting to that and believing in myself that I had earned the respect of my peers for doing something that was different but not necessarily measured in the same way as perhaps the traditional army model measures it was quite difficult and it's, it's still something that I'm working on to deal with now that I've transitioned back from being fully military to being dual career so there's lots around that transition and I think crosses over into the social side where you're seeking approval from friends and this kind of idea of social currency and and making sure that we're comfortable and happy health and healthy in our environment so yeah there's been lots of challenges to my well-being from all three sides thanks so much that's a really thoughtful take on what well-being means to you and I think that's actually going to be really helpful for our listeners um to think about it in those three different aspects and it's good to hear you face challenges despite having such a kind of decorated career and that you're still human even though you are such a superstar in many ways including now being a rock star as well which I think <laughs> is a brilliant outcome <laughs> of lockdown so well done for that <laughs> my singing ability leaves a lot to be desired so I don't think you'll be seeing me on any stage anytime <laughs> soon <laughs> so another question I have is whether you have a well-being mentor or someone that you look to as a great role model for well-being I do actually. This person has really helped me on quite a holistic journey through personal well-being and understanding it. And I, I really do view well-being as holistic. So one of my founding principles, if I can be so bold to call it that, comes back to nutrition. What it's really important as an athlete to eat well because you know that is your fuel, but it's also really important to eat well from a well-being perspective. So my mentor is a woman called Lizzie. She um, is a life coach and a very good friend and has been a she was actually a friend of and colleague of my mum's before 
I met her, but we, we were born on the same day. We're a few years apart. Um, she's a little bit older than me, but we look at life in, in a very similar way in many, many ways. And she has inspired me to understand myself better and to look after myself, but also to look at the world in a different way and to try and bring positivity and improve the well-being of those around me. So coming back to nutrition, it was whilst I was on course with Lizzie training to do some life coaching, we were talking about nutrition and it suddenly dawned on me that food is the building blocks of our body. Everything that we are is because of the food that we eat. Not eating good stuff and healthy stuff, then we're not giving ourselves the best chance of being happy and healthy and living a good life. So for me, nutrition is where it all starts and and trying to eat well underpins everything that I do. And then going back to the kind of social side, again, this idea of choosing very carefully what we eat. I'm not a vegan. I'm not that selective in the the food I eat because I love foods across all spectrums. But I am starting to be much more selective about where my food comes from and considering like the environmental impact and how sustainable it is. And I think that gives me a real sense of well-being because I feel like I'm making choices that make me feel good and, and help Um, society hopefully makes a difference to the rest of the world so working with Lizzie inspired me to have those thoughts and then she's a blue health life coach and by that I mean all of her coaching is done down by the beach being close to water is really important there's this idea that water is medicine and it helps our well-being so for me um, this idea is really important I spend as much time as I can in on or around water just it's a really calming influence for me and is a really lovely way to spend a day she has really inspired me to think carefully about what I do and also to incorporate this idea of water um, for well-being into my life and to continue to, to develop that. She sounds like an absolutely fantastic person to have in your life. Someone who's really positive, also has some really good ideas about how to look after yourself. What advice would you give to people that can't necessarily be by the water or on the snow all the time? Is, is there anything she would suggest that you could do as an alternative or you know, a way to think about being in that kind of mindset? Yeah, I think surrounding yourself by blue is one way of doing it. So you could bring some paintings of water, um, having blue space and green space and having plants is not quite blue space but it it really helps so having plants around you um getting out into nature if you're listening to this and you live in london there are actually lots of waterways in london that you can just go for a stroll go for half an hour and sit and watch the water go by and i firmly believe that most people will feel calmer after doing that just sitting by the canal or you know, if you can find a quiet spot, listen to the birds, take a minute and, and be in nature. For her, water is the really important thing. For me, I've taken that further and I've got into being in nature and just um, listening and looking and feeling the environment. That's um, just really fantastic advice and definitely something that we can all take heed of, whether we're in London or working from home, wherever that might be. So yeah. thank you for that. Um, so can you talk about a time when you've struggled mentally or physically, um, how you overcame that and perhaps what resources you used? Yeah, I think this is something I think which is quite common for many athletes, possibly not really talked about or necessarily understood. And when you have great success in a Games, you know, we, we won four medals, including gold at the Paralympics, and suddenly you arrive back in the UK and you're a mini celebrity. We landed in Heathrow on the, uh, on the 19th of March 2018, and having had a really busy few days finishing racing going through the closing ceremony having a bit of a party to celebrate the end of the games getting on the flight and then landing back in the UK we went into two hours solid of interviews with British media and then for the next two weeks Mena and I were dashing up and down from London to Manchester working with BBC with Channel 4 doing interviews radio all sorts of things you get thrown into this there's no kind of preparation for it really unless you've been through it before once all of that started to wind down a bit so firstly that you feel a huge amount of pressure because you're suddenly in the limelight you feel like you need to have this external image which perhaps isn't natural and certainly as somebody who's in the military where we don't talk about our public image it's quite challenging actually having this external persona and being thrust into the limelight actually talking to the media is quite comfortable but having your life on display is less comfortable 
And I think I really struggled mentally. Um, I was going through quite a difficult time in my relationship. There was a lot of changes in life. There was all sorts of things going on in the background. And I was going through um, what I didn't really realise at the time, but what many people would recognise as depression and really, really struggling. And it wasn't until probably nine months later that I really recognised that and started to be able to do something about it. So I turned to my friends and started talking about it which was really helpful one thing which I think a lot of people are unaware of is that a lot of contraception causes depression and um, so I changed that to try and improve it and I also started seeing a counsellor there is still a lot of stigma around speaking to counsellors I feel but I would recommend it to anybody whether you are suffering from anything like depression or not actually I think it's a really useful tool and particularly for people who work in uh, high pressure jobs in business. And the the analogy I use is like, so when I have aches and pains with my muscles, I go and see a physio and I will um, see them if I've got something specific that I want to talk to them about to try and fix a, you know, a, a pain in my back. But I also go and see them on a weekly basis. I will just go and go in for a, a checkup and I see counselling in a similar way not not on a weekly basis perhaps but certainly on a on a monthly or a quarterly basis I still see a counsellor and talk to them and it's just having that person who's external to the rest of your life who is able to just have a a totally neutral perspective on life they really helped me through um, quite a difficult dark time in my life in 2018 understanding where I was in that transition kind of post Paralympics but I've continued to talk to somebody regularly just as a almost a maintenance um, and a a self-care mechanism to help me work through some of those issues that perhaps you don't want to talk to your friends and family about and it's been a really really useful tool. Thank you so much for sharing that it's not something it's always easy to talk about so it's really good to hear you um, being so open and honest about it. Hopefully people listening will feel that they can reach out. I know even talking to friends, they don't feel comfortable talking about it or don't want to admit. But when you're open and honest with that kind of thing, I find people are more open and honest with you. So hopefully, even if it's one person that it helps, then that's cool. Thank you so much, Jen, for giving us such um, brilliant insights into your fascinating career and also for sharing some advice for how we can think about and also take control of our own well-being. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you both so much for having me. It's been brilliant, um, hopefully useful advice. If anybody wants to follow Mena and my journey to the next Paralympics uh, in 2022, you can do so on Instagram at Mena and Jen. Um, It'd be great to see some of you following us. Jen, Becky, thank you so much for your time. A great conversation with some really open and honest insight around the topic of wellbeing. To our audience, we hope you enjoyed this and found it useful. Have a great day. Thank you.